Hello, my name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is on structure. Structure of a culture. My God, where do we start? The best or the worst? Okay, let's begin with autocracy in that case, which involves authority held in power by one person. There are a few kinds of autocracy. For instance, the age of kings, where the rule was a patriarchy in which power is with a male or a group of males, as with the kings. Patriarchies were similar to feudalism in the Middle Ages, which were used as specific law-defined systems called the high-yield term estate system. Estate systems split society into a social hierarchy. For example, nobility, clergy, serfs. The exact distinction between patriarchy and feudalism will not be on the MCAT, so you do not have to worry about it. There is another system, however, One where the rich stay rich and the poor stay poor. One where you're born into a class. This sad system is called a caste system, where you're cast into your societal place. Luckily, we don't have that in America, a place where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. But some places still have this caste system in place, like India. Caste systems lead to social stratification because there is no social mobility. If it sucks now, well, just wait 20 years. You won't move an inch and you'll be twice as old. In addition, caste systems have social reproduction as a result of being placed into a class which you were born into. So what type of status is this? An ascribe status, exactly, as in the case of your social hierarchy. But the ascribe status could also be your sex, race, etc. In America, There is a higher price paid for your achieve status, which is not surprisingly an achievement, like an automobile manager or chocolate engineer. Achieve statuses are really important in meritocracies, which involve holding power based on your achievements or merits. Now, this is how it should be. That's what's great about America. You can become nearly anything you want, and as Les Brown said, to be successful, you must be willing to do the things today that others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow that others won't have. In order to have these intricate relationships and stratification, there must be multiple levels of interaction involving both micro and macro sociology. This brings us to Bronfen Brenner's ecological systems theory, which outlined five different systems, only three of which are particularly important. The macro system involves the ideas of a culture and attitudes that they have. Here is where the culture can support the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Here is socioeconomic status, so the macro system. The micro system includes those groups and institutions impacting children's socialization, like the family and school, but also their religious institutions if they have one. So micro system is socialization from institutions. The meso system is just a connection between the micro systems. So between the church, the state, your friends, ha, yeah, right, etc. About two decades prior, there was a theory called the open systems theory, which nicely opened up a platform for the ecological systems theory we just discussed. Open systems theory claimed organizations are heavily influenced by their surroundings, their context, their environment. This could be economical or social factors. Thus, there is an, this is key, input and output on numerous levels. Hmm, kind of like an open system. The idea is somewhat similar to exosystem from the ecological systems theory, one of the systems that were less important. Just if you're curious, the exosystem is the environmental influences affecting the child's development, but that doesn't directly involve the child. For example, had my parents been drug dealers, I may have gotten used to these really strange people walking up and into the house and demanding their whack or tic-tac or whatever those were. Actually, I looked it up on Drug Slang Translator, so saying I had two Tic Tacs but no whack is really saying I had two PCP in powder form but no crack cocaine, heroin, or marijuana laced with insecticides. Damn. So that's your exosystem affecting you. All right, now that we laid the bases of these different societal systems, let's hit some theories looking at society as a whole, like functionalism. Functionalism is heavily influenced by the seminal works by Amelia Durkheim, in the early 1900s, and it was later influenced by others working on the concept. Institutions and organizations have functions, and those functions sustain their existence in society. Like, the government is necessary to maintain order, or the school to teach the next generation. These are their manifest functions. 
the ones where they are manifested to perform their purpose. Make sense? However, sometimes they perform latent functions which may be good or bad. For instance, some institutions may unintentionally diminish growth by insisting on believing in their rituals, or an educational system may maintain class hierarchy. These are the latent functions. All these functions make sure everyone is doing their job while providing divisions of labor. Like you have your drug dealer on the street and your officer taking the drug dealer off the street. This way, everyone is staying busy. Durkheim also coined the term anime for times when societal instabilities results in a breakdown of standards, like nominating Trump for president. Ha! Just kidding. He's now our president. Last to mention about Durkheim is that societies can be mechanically or organically cohesive. That is to say, when you work with people in the same job as you, there tends to be feelings of togetherness, right? A mechanical cohesion between you, like two mechanics attached at the hip or something like that. Whereas to be organically solid would be the dependence you have on other jobs. Like how dealers depend on their suppliers who depend on their border transporters, who depend on their chemists, who depend on their growers. It's beautiful if you really think about it. And remember, it's organic. Well, organic solidarity in this society. Nicely continuing on with these societal theories, this brings us to our next most important theory of macro sociology, conflict theory. Karl Marx, the creator of conflict theory, said that there was two classes. The bourgeoisie, who were the bosses, the owners, the makers of money. And there were the proletariat. These were the poor, the workers, the non-makers of money. This dichotic relationship is extremely popular in capitalism because there is a huge reward for CEOs, but rarely a reward for the workers underneath them. Like a meritocracy for only a couple people while the rest get nothing. I have a riddle for you. The rich people want it, and poor people have it. What is it? Nothing! But anyways, these proletariats were falsely believing in a false consciousness. The false perception that they are there because they did something wrong and the situation cannot change. What does that sound like? It sounds like some sort of learned helplessness to me. Learned helplessness was coined by Seligman. Just FYI. Once the proletariat situation was crappy enough, they would begin to develop from a false consciousness to a class consciousness, thus understanding the situation they're in and understanding it's completely unfair. The main idea of conflict theory, inequality. Please note that conflict theory sharply contrasts with consensus theory, which argues that society has fair systems. And because of the fair systems, society changes need to happen through institutions and not through conflict as conflict theory purports. So what does this sound like? Functionalism! We just talked about it. Functionalism is a consensus theory because it doesn't address issues of conflict. Remember, to conflict theory, once the proletariat reach the class consciousness, all they want to do is stick it to the man, right? Fight that plutocracy. A.K.A. fight the wealthy people who rule everything. Fight the power. This inevitably leads to competition and death. All right, not necessarily death. A manner in which the bourgeoisie can control those below them is by gatekeeping. Gatekeeping involves filtering information before it reaches the public. Like some countries do nowadays, ones that will not be named because they make all our stuff and we owe them a lot of money. Gatekeeping is definitely present in Irving Goffman's Total Social Institutions. Goffman, if you remember, made the dramaturgical approach. Remember the mnemonic? Get off the stage! Off the stage! Goffman, good. Goffman did research on prisons, asylums, and other similar institutions and found them to be all-encompassing for the lives of the participants. Huh, <laughs> participants. Well, unwilling participants in these cases. They were totalitarian systems because they had control over every aspect of the participant's life. And in some cases, in these total social institutions, there was little distinction between the public and private life. Total social institutions make it pretty simple to predict what people and institutions are going to do. But is the real world that simple? Definitely not. The world is full of chaos. You have cars that drive themselves, dudes and chicks who ghost on you, an intersection with two Starbucks. Two. Why does there need to be two Starbucks in any one corner? I don't know. Well, the people trying to make sense of all this madness are chaos theorists, stemming from chaos theory, 
which is actually a mathematical theory which affects multiple disciplines. Chaos theory argues that these social systems are complex and unpredictable. So in order to make sense of it all, they must look towards the tendencies or needs of a society like shopping stores or dispensaries for those in the Denver Mile High Club. There are other ways, however, to understand the societal interworkings. A super high yield approach of these inner workings is symbolic interactionism, made in the 20s, which posits that our responses and actions in society are based on meaningful symbols. Symbolic interactionism argues our whole understanding of life is based off of our cultural interpretations, like the interpretation of the hand gesture that that guy gave you when you cut them off this morning. Do you remember who is considered the pioneer of symbolic interactionism? I'll give you a hint. He cares way too much about looking at himself in the mirror. Exactly. Herbert Mead, who created the looking glass self, the I and the me. Discuss in the developmental episode. And if you remember the mnemonic for the I and the me, what do I want to be from what others think of me? Symbolic interactionism is very similar to social constructionism, which is very important here, because these symbols are analogous to social constructs in many circumstances. Social constructionism is simply that our social understandings are based on our society and culture instead of actual reality. Does this sound familiar? Well, that's what a cultural relativist would say, how our social constructs are based on our culture. It's all relative to our culture. As an example of this phenomenon, think of all the different ways that you can flip someone off in other cultures and how we would see it. If a French person flipped you off, you would think that they were making an OK sign. If they were from Italy, you would think that they were saying rock on. If they're from Brazil and you drove a truck, you would probably honk. If it had been from Vietnamese, you would probably think that they were crossing their fingers because they were making a wish or something or maybe hoping that you don't try to talk to them. Who knows? So there is both the strong and weak social constructionism. The strong social constructionism argues that everything is a social construct and that nothing is reality, like being in the matrix. Whereas weak social constructionism is that constructs depend on facts and the construction is just our collective agreement on them. These are similar, very similar, to the strong and weak hypotheses in the linguistic relativity hypothesis from the language episode. Now, Murray Bowen had another approach to understanding why people act and react the way they do. He argued that it was all about understanding what is going on inside the families, thus family systems theory. If you're frustrated while you're at work, it's probably because you're not spicing things up at home or perhaps your significant other has been getting on your nerves. This would be worse depending on whether you live with your extended family instead of just your nuclear family, which nuclear family is the basic social unit of a couple and their children. So family systems theory argues that you are inseparable from your social networks. Lastly, when your country is so far developed that instead of family relations, you get all your socialization from Facebook, you've entered a new low called mass society theory. The mass society in this Theory is referring to just a conglomeration of disconnected groups, impartial relationships, and more detachment than Facebook could ever hope to cure. And that is the end of the episode.